Well, good evening and welcome to Case Filters UK's third ever Sunday night session. Um, hopefully you are all pouring in down the side there. You're very welcome. Uh, it's been a beautiful day actually up in Scotland, certainly lots of snow around. So we've had a very enjoyable morning. I'm here uh, with Alistair Ben, who Alistair is uh, well known to so many of you. Alistair, you've been out in the snow as well, as I understand this morning. We have, we have. It's unusual for us to get so much up here. So uh, it's the only bit of Scotland that's getting some snow is the west coast so yeah we've been out playing in it making snow angels most of the day <laughs> snow angels like my <laughs> like my five-year-old niece this afternoon i love it i love it <laughs> anyway if you've not been with us before my name is ruth taylor i'm hosting these sunday night sessions we have guest photographers every fortnight i'm delighted to be here with alistair tonight lots of you will know uh, of alistair ben multi-award winning uh, landscape photographer and we're going to be chatting to him in just a couple of moments just a few items of housekeeping though first up if you haven't been with us before uh there's a chat you'll see there on YouTube it's uh, either over there or over there I'm not entirely sure it's somewhere but you can chat with us throughout the evening tonight if you want to ask Alistair any questions feel free to pop those in just so you know there is a wee bit of a delay it takes us maybe about 10 seconds or so uh, for those to pop up on our side so if we don't answer straight away it's nothing personal uh, just pop them in there and we will see them um, and finally this session tonight is going to be available to rewatch again obviously we're live just now you can rewatch it again on the Case Filters UK YouTube channel. It'll be available, I think, pretty much just straight away after. So if you miss any of it or you want to pass it on to your friends, uh, you'll be able to share that link very, very soon after. So I think that's about it housekeeping wise. Um, I think we'll get started. Alistair, multi award winning landscape photographer. Uh, you're also in charge of expressive um, expressive photography. Expressive, I'm sorry, um, this is really awful. Expressive photography, yes. You run workshops and you also mentor, don't you, as far as I'm aware? You mentor other photographers. Yeah, we, we started the mentorship uh, just this year, actually. We're just finishing the first month of that. Um, Again, you know, we, we we theoretically run workshops, but obviously the last 12 months have been uh, somewhat unusual uh, in that we haven't run any. Uh, yeah. So what we're really having to do is kind of reinvent ourselves and find other ways to make an income. Uh, so selling eBooks, uh, selling videos, that type of thing, the YouTube channel. And of course, uh, the mentoring has been a, an addition to that. There was, I got quite a lot of people asking me for it. Um, so yeah, I've started up and, and I'm doing those sessions now and, and it's working. Uh, people are enjoying it and it's, it's been kind of fun. There's always, there's always silver linings to, to things like lockdown. And you've got, a, obviously, your expressive photography YouTube channel as well, which you've been able to get out and about and get a wee bit of content for uh, over the last months as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're very strict on ourselves about not uh, mixing and socialising and things like that, even though we've got lots and lots of very good friends close, uh, even in Glencoe and places like that. But according with the law we're, we're still able to get out into the landscape because it's my job mm -hmm. uh, so it says you, you work from home which we do most of the time but equally we need to go out into the landscape to to make content yeah. and uh, to make images for illustrating books and mm -hmm. videos and all that type of stuff absolutely all right well listen, let's launch into our 10 questions we kind of runs off a 10 question format so it's quite simple um and as i said before guys if you want to ask questions on the chat just feel free to pop those in but let's get started with uh basically alistair how you got started and i've read a wee bit about uh, about i know you didn't start off in photography from the get-go straight out of school or anything like that no. how did you get started in photography um i kind of got into my 30s and I had a bit of time on my hands. Uh, my work had, had gone quite well. And I was living in the Far East at the time. I was living in uh, China predominantly, uh, Tibet and China. Oh. Um, and I just had time. Um, and it was getting back into photography. It was bird watch, uh, My bird watching got me back into photography. I really wanted to photograph birds. And, and I did that kind of um, to, to a sort of semi-professional level for mm -hmm. about six years. And then when I decided that making a career out of photography was something I wanted to do, landscapes just seemed a bit more um, easy <laughs> than <laughs> bird photography when yeah. I was living in China because birds are extremely uh, flighty and uh, mm -hmm. cautious in China, so they're not very easy to photograph. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of got back into it in my 30s and then 
So it's about 20 years now I've um, been back into landscape photography. Um, and yeah, I never expected to be making a living doing it, I think. Um, so yeah, Living the dream. The, the weird path that life takes us on. Now, Alistair, just before we started, you were showing me your guitars. Have you got any other uh, hobbies, obviously, besides photography? I'm guessing, you, I'm guessing you're a musician. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I play, uh, I've been playing guitar for about, well, God, 40 years now, I guess. Um, and yeah, I, I enjoy making music. Uh, it's something else that's creative uh, mm -hmm. without being photography. I think as soon as photography becomes your career, um, your relationship with it can change where suddenly it's about utility and mm -hmm. function and fame and popularity and all of those things. Whereas I get to make music just for me and, and that is joyful. Yeah, I completely agree. Very, a little bit of the joy is not, it's not all sucked out, but you know, you're right. Once you, once you have to do it for a living, it's not, it's not quite the same as it's. Well, you have to balance it. it, it you, mm. you know, you sometimes, to enjoy it. you know, running a business is business. Uh, mm. You you have to have a business brain and you, you have to, you, you can't just go out and make photographs. I mean, that's not what being a professional landscape photographer is. It seems to be the most untrue myth is that yeah. landscape photographers just go out and make photographs all mm -hmm. the time. I spend 80% of my life in this office. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Eight, yeah. The old 80-20 <laughs> yeah. rule. Um, oh. Favourite shooting conditions, Alistair? I mean, I've noticed, I've been having a wee flick through your, uh, through your gallery, and it seems to me that when you're shooting, um, it's always about the atmosphere. That an image portrays. Um, what, what are your favourite shooting conditions? I do love atmosphere. I, yeah. I think fog and mist are mm. are really friendly elements, um, and I think people respond to atmosphere really well because it can uh, summon up so many different emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, great light is easier, I think, to give impact and to to get people sucked into your photographs. But yeah, I think I think. Uh, you know, you can convey so many different emotions, melancholy, uh, calm, uh, mm -hmm. tranquility, all of those kind of nice things. So, yeah, I think atmosphere is, is a good one. So you spotted that straight away. I, I, I absolutely did. It's fascinating, <laughs> actually. It's fascinating what you can learn from someone just by flicking through their photographs with a notepad and just, you know, That's true. Yes. realizing, and you know, what they enjoy doing. I mean, on the same vein, you know, you make nearly all of your landscapes, I've noticed so far, seem intimate. Um and you had an interesting post up this morning. I noticed. I was going to say that uh, I was going. To, um, the question is basically big landscapes versus intimate. And I was going to say I think for you it's intimate. But you did have a post up this morning uh, where you said that actually you do have a big love for big landscapes as well. It's really weird because up until 2016, I just shot big landscapes. I was, I mean, I was living in Tibet. I was living in the Himalaya. I was, you know, getting to travel to Canada and the States and Iceland and all of these amazingly beautiful places. And then I went to the Gobi Desert in January 2017, and I went seven times into the Gobi on my own and running workshops. Um, and it changed my entire creative process. And everything got really introspective, I suppose. I got quite uh, introverted uh, mm -hmm. and was interested in the psychology of of line and form and and uh, transitions of texture and patterns and all of this type of thing um and i went down the rabbit hole for that to the point where i just i hated big landscapes it was just it was everything had been done i felt mm -hmm. like it was trite it was you know and i had a big epiphany this week where i just realized that i loved the landscape and um yeah, that post from last night was, it was literally an epiphany in the last 24, 36 hours. I was out uh, on the west of Scotland yesterday and was just looking at the mountains rising up out of the fog covered in snow. And I just thought, yeah, that's a big landscape. And it was a bit of a shock to sort of realise that I still had a love for that. And then today I was out in my 12 mil prime uh, photographing, well, a very famous Scottish mountain covered in snow with ice patterns in the foreground and stuff. So yeah, I've, I've rediscovered my uh, wide angle lens mojo. It's fascinating, <laughs> you swing so far one way and you get so sick of something, but actually, you know, having it swing back to the middle and getting that balance again is, it's an interesting place to get to. The thing with my work 
is it has to be ethically sustainable. It has to be morally sustainable. Uh, we have a responsibility to the, to the landscape, whether it's in Scotland or anywhere else that we travel. Of course, we're not doing that now, but we have a responsibility to treat the, the, the landscape with care and consideration and nurture it, not just use it as a resource to, to make our photographs to get mm -hmm. Popular yeah. and so forth. Um, so I'm a big advocate of the nature first principle, uh, for example. Um, and I, I found it harder to rationalize shooting dramatic, iconic locations with the impact that every footfall has on those locations versus shooting anonymous woodland on the west of Scotland that nobody knows where it is. And you're not going to get that footfall. And, and you know this on Sky with famous locations that the impact of every footfall can be severe. So it's balancing that responsibility to the landscape with um, shooting what I love to shoot. Yeah, uh, um, Andrew's asking on the chat there, isn't the big landscape just as valid from a documentary perspective, for example, to show the viewer what the location looks like? Absolutely. You know, I think uh, what someone commented on that post that you were referring to, and they said, from the tiniest leaf to the moon and everything in between is fair game for the landscape photographer. And, and I thought, yeah, that's absolutely true. And it, it doesn't matter if you're getting fascinated with frost over an oak leaf or the way water's flowing over a, a striated riverbed, or it's the Bucolet of Moor on the west coast of Scotland covered in snow like I was shooting this morning. Um, it's all valid, it's all mm -hmm. valid. And as, as long as you're, I think, however, as soon as you put popularity first, then I think there's a line somewhere that you're crossing where your motive for being there and making the photograph may not be aligned with with I don't know that that's a difficult one the, 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 is it, is it be. Yeah. Um, Pamela's asking where you're based Alistair uh we're in uh, the west coast so we're, we're kind of out in the Ardnamurchan Peninsula which is the furthest west part of the Scottish mainland I was saying I had to double check before. Uh, I, I live on Sky, obviously. Arden Markin is not far away, but it's uh, well. you have to just, just double check where exactly where exactly that is. Um, oh, Pam says he's just answered that. Yeah, yes, he has. So there we go. Um, post processing, Alistair. Now I've mentioned before that you seem to uh, value mood. Uh, in your images over other things. And I've noticed certain images, there was one of the woods, in fact, there was a couple of versions of it. Um, you're not tempted to lighten shadows and things, you know, to make it more, um, to more balanced. Do you, are the emotions that you try and elicit, does that what dictates your approach to post-processing or what is your, what is your post-processing kind of mindset? I'm a very emotional person. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm a, I'm a, I would say I'm unusually emotional. Um, and that used to manifest itself in periods of quite deep melancholy. And the other end of the spectrum was this, this sort of manic joy and energy and enthusiasm. Um, and I, I feel that photography is an expressive thing, which hence expressive photography. Photographs, the old adage that a, a picture can paint a thousand words, if, if a picture is going to paint a thousand words or a photograph is going to articulate a thousand words, I think it's really important to take some degree of ownership of that articulation. Um, now, what I don't do is have any form of repetitive processing. So I don't mm -hmm. start with setting black points and white points and raising my shadows by a hundred and taking my highlights down by a hundred and doing, doing this or that or, or hitting preset buttons or anything mm -hmm. like that. Every photograph is an individual and it's a function of two things. The photograph itself, the raw file, the data, the subject, the atmosphere, the, the kind of geometry and color that's natively in it. And then who we are at that moment in time when we sit down and it's how we process our images because you can darken it by two stops and it becomes a very deep, moody, dark, and sometimes menacing photograph. And you can lighten it by two stops and it suddenly becomes joyful and airy and lighthearted and much more relaxed. Um, so I believe uh, processing is an expressive articulation of how we feel. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like moody images. I, I think they, they convey, people, people relate to to darkness and melancholy. I think mm -hmm. people, you know, there's a lot of joyful images out there in the marketplace and joyful images are great. And I, I enjoy making those also, but there's also a place for the other end of the spectrum. And it's not just a, it's not just some sort of attempt at creating a personal style. It's a genuine expression mm -hmm. of emotion that I was feeling at that time. I mean, it's 
fascinating because I was chatting last time to Stuart McLennan, who's who's down in the lakes, and he was saying, you know, he didn't have to actually sell images. He much prefers the moody, the dark, the menacing, but what sells is the joyful, it's the blue skies. But I think most of us actually genuinely quite enjoy looking at the moody images. And the kind funny because slightly... my, my most popular prints are moody. Yeah. Almost without exception, the stuff I sell is dark and, and quite <laughs> Make you want to stop and look and think and you know process what's uh, yeah. I, I might just have very depressed buyers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Alistair, yeah. another question in the chat here. Andrew saying, as a musician, uh, do you listen to music while post processing, and does it influence at all how you do it? <sighs> That's a very good question, and I've talked about this before. Um, music can certainly influence uh, how we process. And I think I've written articles about this in the past, that you know, if you're listening to Iron Maiden, a, a photograph might turn out very differently from than if you're listening to um, you know, a contemporary uh, classical composer or you're listening to cello music or something like that. Uh, I do listen to music a lot when I process. Um, and I've been known to change the music uh, while I'm processing because it's just not the right music for that photograph. Uh, you know, you have a couple of false starts and it's just like, no, 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 no. Do you always have music on when you're processing? Is that an integral part of what you do then? This is this is interesting to me. I've not, I've not actually thought about, um, you know, having I, music on for a purpose. I think I, 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 unless I'm writing something, mm -hmm. if I'm writing, I listen to classical music without words. So I, I can't listen to words when I'm writing. Yeah. And I spend a lot of my time writing. Uh, so if I'm working in my office and I'm writing, then I'm listening to classical music typically or instrumental music. Uh, and if I'm processing, I'm listening typically to sort of seven string guitar uh, type of thing. So I, I play a lot of that kind of yeah. quite complicated progressive rock music. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of the, the, the music I listen to is quite complex. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that yes. shows in my work. <laughs> it's fascinating, it's fascinating. I mean, speaking of uh, music, are you inspired by any other artists, uh, musicians, photographers, when it comes to your own take, or is it all just it's coming out of what you see and what you want people to to be feeling? Every single one of my friends, close friends, is a world class photographer. You know, whether it's Adam Gibbs or Alex Noriega or Guy Tal or Mark Adamus or you know, I, I could list this endless number of people who are just my closest, closest friends. Mm -hmm. So. All of my friends are great photographers and they inspire me as people more than their work inspires me as a photographer. I don't tend to look at other people's photographs in terms of inspiration. I, I appreciate it for what it is, but it's not me. Um, music inspires my photography more than other photographers so if i'm i can listen to harmonic relationships i can listen to textures um, and the relationships between the bass and the melody and the the layers of atmosphere that you can get in a piece of music that and and the words that come out of musicians mouths when they're being interviewed and talking about creativity talking about expression talking about um development I, th I think there's a great parallel between musicians and any type of artist mm -hmm. so i tend to get more inspiration from the other arts whether it's yeah. dance or music or uh, poetry or writing um, so yeah less about i don't have a lot of photography inspiration but mm -hmm. most of it's musical Fascinating. Um, a question here uh, from the chat. Uh, Togs on tour. You mentioned creativity uh, the other day on social media. What is creativity? Big question uh, for you and what inspires your creativity? I mean, you've already said there, obviously music does. Um, is, that, is that a big one? Um, creativity to me is... Uh... I, I think everyone can be creative. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've got a whiteboard. I've, I've got numerous whiteboards uh, spread around the house because I I, I I need something to write on when my brain kicks in. Um, and I wrote on on one of them the other day. We learn to be square. And I think when we're kids, we're more creative typically than we than when we're adults. And I think society and our education actually makes us less creative. Even people who are in creative jobs get told how to be creative. Yeah. They, they don't want your creativity. They want you to toe the company line in mm -hmm. terms of their creativity or the individual creativity. So I think at the end of the day, I, I do 
I think inquisitive. I think being inquisitive and curious and fascinated by things. Uh, I have a very childlike temperament. Um, when you know, when I was out by the river today, I was just fascinated by the way the ice and the water was flowing over the ice and the rocks and stuff and the geology. So, I, uh, creativity, I think, is. I mean, this is, we don't have enough time for music. No, it's, it's a big question. It's but, a big question. But, you know, if you think about playing music, 99% of musicians, when they're learning, they learn to play other people's music. So whether you pick up a guitar and you want to be Dave Gilmour or any other amazing guitar player, or you're playing piano and you're playing classical pieces from the 16, 17, 1800s, you're learning to play other people's music, or you pick up a classical, uh, an acoustic guitar and you learn to play Beatles tunes most people learn to play their instruments by copying and being inspired by other musicians. The same thing happens typically with cameras. When you buy your camera, you tend to aspire to make photographs like another photographer. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not convinced that a significant percentage of people move beyond that generally, mm -hmm. um, but I think most want to. And I think yeah. that's the big challenge is how to break away from making s photographs that are safe mm -hmm. uh, to pushing boundaries because unfortunately the, the our peer group now is made up of hundreds of millions of people on social media it's not a couple of mates anymore who yeah. say that image is a bit gnarly mm -hmm. it's like tens of thousands of people say that sucks yeah. <laughs> as soon yeah. as that it's happens you, go, yeah. you know that, that means yeah. i'm rubbish so i think self-confidence is the key to creativity is saying yeah. my voice counts it's I think you're right. It's, you're saying that kids, when they're little, they've got, they're more creative naturally. I don't think they're as likely to compare themselves to anybody else. They don't have those same inhibitions. They just go for it. Whereas when you get a bit older, you but, see but what does your education do? You go to school and you have to fit in with all the other little brats in the class. So the if, you have the, if, you, if you have the wrong trainers and the wrong top on, so if you if you want to try and be creative, you get you get mocked and bullied yeah. so right. self-confidence is a, is, a, is a you know a huge part of it which little what little kids have naturally and then it kind of gets torn out of you and it's the kind of thing i think it's a space you have to grow to and it takes quite a long a long a long time to get to that place it's uh you got to, kind of unlearn. <laughs> you, you got to unlearn and then relearn how to be yourself which is really challenging it's chat it is and it's, it's a fascinating fascinating journey um a wee bit not off topic i was going to say uh, what am i saying here um favorite location do you have a favorite location i noticed you talked earlier about the gobi desert and i know you've got actually uh, a book your first printed book coming out in the spring um is the gobi yes the gobi the gobi probably changed my life more than anywhere else um as, as a photographer and as a person, I think the Gobi really changed it. Um, living in Tibet for seven or eight years changed my life also. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of Scotland, I love being at home. Uh, I, it, it, that's a really tough question because I think my favorite place is literally where I am in any given moment and that feeling of enthusiasm and excitement to explore and, and to kind of get on with it. Having said that, I went for a walk in a wood this afternoon and I hated it. It was so awful. <laughs> it was really? true. So that was not a favourite location. <laughs> <laughs> what was wrong with it as a matter of interest? Uh, it was slushy, slushy, slushy snow, oh, slushy. very, 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 very busy forest uh, okay. and absolutely nothing that, yeah. that even I could work on. Snowy forest. You, you want it to be quiet and silent and still yeah. and ethereal. And you don't want people and slush. That's just... That's well, there, was just no, there was no people, but it was just really, really busy with trees. Oh, yeah. Fair dues, fair enough. Um, do you have a most memorable moment in photography? Um, I'm guessing maybe the Gobi again. I know it's one of the most uh, pivotal photo moments. Photographing the Milky Way over Mount Kailash in Tibet was, oh. was a key moment. Uh, photographing the Milky Way over Mount Everest uh, was a really memorable moment. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had, I've had a, I've had more than my fair share of incredible memorable photographic moments uh, i i basically think that every time you push the shutter it's your diary of engagement yeah that it's it's like every time you push the shutter you're basically saying 
I am very into what I'm looking at right now. Um, and I think that's something I try and do as often as possible. But yes, I've, obviously, I've, I've been to some incredible places and seen some amazing things. Um, a question in from the chat from Paul, uh, Paul Benito Brook. What's your approach to competitions? Do you shoot specifically for them or do you use what's in your archive? I, I, I entered my first competition in 2012 and I won it. And I, I, <laughs> no pressure. I, I almost decided to quit competitions after that because I thought I've got a hundred percent success rate. Exactly. Um, and I, I entered a few for, for the next few years. And I think the last time I entered anything was about 2017, something like that. It's about four years now since I've entered any competitions. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't intend to start again. Um, I, I, I think that it's a bit arbitrary sometimes who wins these things. Uh, and I think I, I, I don't make my photographs to be judged, I think, um, as, as a better, worse kind of type of situation. Um, I, I, so yeah, I, I'm not desperate to, to enter any more competitions. I found it's one of those things. You like you say, you you enter if you win. It's you don't often see the the kind of more popular names entering again. It seems to be you know there's you win it once or twice, and I don't know. Is it, is it are you fool? Is that it? You're you're over it then? I, 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 no, I I think that most competitions. Uh, the, I had a big conversation with Adam Gibbs about this on my YouTube channel not so long ago, actually. We were talking about the International Landscape Photographer of the Year competition, which was mm -hmm. announced the winner a, a, a couple of months ago. And, you know, all photography is valid. It's all amazing. You know, there's so many amazing things out there. But a lot of pho photographs that do well are from incredible locations in uh, amazing light. And processed to an inch of their lives um because that look is very very popular it's it's just the majesty of the landscape and the skill of processing them to make them look so amazing and if you don't have access to that type of landscape um then you're at a distinct disadvantage you know you're it's very difficult to go down to a local uh, marsh in Sussex or somewhere like that and try and win a competition when it's flat and you've got reefs and a couple of clouds it's uh, so I, I just feel uh, education is my primary focus I want to help educate people in terms of how to be a better photographer how to be a happier photographer how to be an expressive photographer and I think competition is you can sometimes take your eye off the ball because you're making images to be popular you're making images that are going to win um, and i think when you bring competition into art and creativity you know it's all if i was playing guitar and it's like well this song is going to go into a competition and i'm going to have to yeah. beat some other kid from brazil then you know you, you start changing how you're going to create to to win a competition instead of just doing what you want to do when you put it that way it's uh, you, you see it in a whole different a whole different light um ali's just saying she understands uh what tibet and how that changes she cycled the friendship highway and oh. visited numerous monasteries she says it's unbelievable uh, that, that's um, quite a cycle I've, yeah. seen people, I've seen people doing that you know going past on a land cruiser and just looking out the window and just thinking they are mad so it's <laughs> up, that, up that, over five thousand meters on a bicycle is hard work yeah so, well, i will i believe it is um do you have any top tips for anybody who is just getting started in landscape photography? Um, I got this one recently. Um, and I said, don't believe anything you read in the top tip. That was my <laughs> top tip. I like that. Um, if, you're, if you're just getting started in landscape photography, um, I would say that point your camera at things that you're fascinated with. Absolutely. Learn the difference between craft and vision um which is that if you if you see something and you want to manifest that then you need to learn how to manifest that so there's a certain amount of craft with the guitar it might be how to tune it it might be you know uh, how to put the strings back on or how to play a chord um, you need to learn those things if you mm -hmm. want to write songs um, and equally, if you want to make photographs, you need to understand the tool. So reading the manual is a pretty good place to start. Um, I would be wary of diving too deeply into rules. 
Um, and I've had big discussions with this uh, over years and years about this. I've never been a great rule follower. Um, and some people say that the rules help you to get better quicker. Um, but unfortunately, they also teach you how to be the same as everybody else really fast. Um, and it's very hard to break out of that again once you become template oriented. Yeah. Once you start looking at the landscape in a certain way, it can be very difficult to break out of that. I mean, I think some people have a natural eye for the landscape and maybe to them rules are easier to kind of ignore from the get-go. But you're right, sometimes at the beginning, having those rules there as a template, as as just kind of a tool to kind of springboard off. And then once you get a little bit more comfortable, then, you know, absolutely rules are made to be broken. Yeah, I, I've had loads of conversations with people like Guy Tal about this. I mean, he's a real academic photographer. Mm -hmm. um, and... A rule, a rule's only a rule if it if it if it works. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I've I've got loads of photographs that don't follow any rules, but they still work as photographs. Um, and you can rationalise anything. Um, it's just I I I prefer using the word consequences. There's consequences of everything we do, and the the consequences either make people feel ill, <laughs> or or they make people feel joy and happiness. And there's a spectrum uh, of how people react to our work. Uh, but sometimes it, it's not written down anywhere that photographs have to be beautiful, pretty, and calming. Yeah. They can be they can be angsty and tense and claustrophobic mm -hmm. and melancholy. Now you try making a rule to describe that, but it still works. Yeah. All right. So top tips. Ignore the top tips. <laughs> I like I like never, uh, never believe top tips. Anyone that, <laughs> anyone that says, you know, the top 10 ways to become a great landscape photographer. I mean, it works on YouTube, doesn't it? That's pretty much all you see photography related to photography tips, tips, tips. And there's something I think in our psyche that wants the kind of, uh, you know, the quick nugget, the short, snappy, you know, tip is, to just it's, get it's somewhere great, faster. The, the, my top tip here, here's my top tip getting where you want to go requires effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and anything that gets you there faster and it is somehow a substitute for effort mm -hmm. is basically your, it's the classic selling your soul type scenario because less of you is going to get to the destination mm -hmm. because you're eroding yourself by listening to all of these shortcuts. So don't go past the if, process. If you, want the to go, if you want to go with shortcuts, that's great. But you're yeah. not going to be you when you get to the, the destination. If you put the time in, put the effort in and serve your time, then there's going to be more of you at your destination. Um, a question in the chat again, Alistair. What is the most important thing that photography gives you? Uh, an income. <laughs> 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 right yes. At the moment. It's... I know that's not what the question means. Um, <laughs> You're getting all the hard questions tonight. It, it serves. I'm I'm doing the thing that I'm meant to do, which is, I, I believe I I'm doing this because I have something to offer, um, not just the marketplace or art or whatever. But I'm I'm so wrapped up in the psychology of personal development and overcoming a lot of these barriers and people not having a lot of self esteem or they don't. Have of self-value about themselves or they've been living in abusive relationships and then they're being told that their opinion doesn't matter or the, they suffer from anxiety or depression or panic attacks. So photography can be an incredibly healing and therapeutic pastime. And society makes us very good at not doing that because we get so sucked into making photographs to be popular. And mm -hmm. then when we're not popular, we get anxiety. So it's photography can give us everything as long as we allow it to do so. And I think that's the main thing on the Express Photography YouTube channel and in the eBooks that I write is there's a, a strong message of therapy, self-help, self-development mm -hmm. and creativity and self-development walk hand in hand because creativity is a function of ourselves. And mm -hmm. if you're miserable and depressed, your creativity will suffer mm -hmm. if you're feeling empowered and self-confident and self-actualized you're giving yourself every opportunity to be, to be to be creative if if i was walking around getting told i sucked at guitar 20 hours a day i would never pick up a guitar but i'm in a relationship with my wife who's super supportive of my guitar playing and it makes me a better uh, a better guitar player yeah. 
because I feel confident in articulating myself with the guitar. And it's the same with the camera. If you're if you're supported and nurtured and people uh, are are willing to listen to what you're saying, that's what photography gives to me is it's this photography for me is just a metaphor. It's just a metaphor for my life. Uh, so photography gives me creative living. Yeah, where where it's about being trying to be the best version of myself and trying to be a decent person, you know. So photography kind of helps me with that. This is it's very refreshing to hear. I mean, obviously you're on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and yeah. you'll get comments and likes and all the rest of it. Do, do you just um I mean, obviously if you get encouraging comments, they they're still marvelous to get. Do you do you just not not let it phase you either way? Are you happy to ignore them or I mean I know you respond to the comments on your stuff it's it's a hard one isn't it social media with um, business, you know business you know you have to you have to isolate yourself from business you know expressive photography is my business um, and Christine and I work incredibly hard to produce all this content um, and of course if if you put something on you know being popular if you're if if no one knows Alistair Ben's name, if no one knows my work, if no one knows that I've got ebooks and videos and a, a YouTube channel and all of that stuff, it doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. You're you're not going to make a living. Now I need to make a living out of landscape photography. Mm -hmm. This is my job. Um, so a certain degree of popularity is required. Now we've we've, we've crossed that threshold now where we have a significant number of people who support our work yeah. and that buys you that comfort zone. I'm very, very fortunate that I get precious little abuse. I get very, very, very few uh, trolling type mm -hmm. incidents. And, you know, I, I, I don't get very many, if any, these days, negative yeah. comments, thankfully. Uh, I know some of my friends get horrible abuse online, uh, especially the women. Really? Yeah, horrific, horrific abuse, uh, and and that must be terrible. So, anyone who does that should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a final question, then, Alistair. Do you have a favorite case filter? This is not a creative question. Uh, well, it's a creative question. Well, Do you well, have? You were it's funny because, um, you know, I, I know this is a case uh, show, um, but I got bombarded with filters. Uh, from other manufacturers for a long, long time uh, with people wanting me to represent them. And I always held off because I was never 100% happy with the product. Um, and the case filters, I am. They're absolutely indestructible. Uh, I remember Tim Parkin and I were throwing them on a concrete patio one <laughs> trying to break one <laughs> and, and failing. Um, but uh, I, 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 guess, I, I guess just the canine holder with the CPL integrated into it, I have that on my camera all the time. I literally, it stays on whatever lens I'm using. Um, I really like the three stop reverse grad and I tend to use a six stopper more than anything else. So the six stopper and the, the three stop reverse grad are like my go-to combo, I suppose. Yeah. A uh, question from Horia, uh, so just talking about social media we were speaking about there. So do you miss the good old why take days? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't, I'm I, not sure what that is, but I'm guessing you do. In 2011, myself and uh, our uh, Rafael Rojas, uh, we started uh, a nature photography website called Why Take. Um, and it was, it was a a celebration of nature photography. So there was landscapes and macro and birds and stuff like that. And it was, it was a community. It was just like a, a bulletin board plus a very, very beautifully designed website. And yes, I do miss it uh, because it was something special. We, we built something that had huge amounts of integrity, um, but we got hacked. Um, oh. And the, the money it was going to cost us to try and keep the hackers out was just horrific. Um, and also it was so time consuming. I mean, I was trying to build my workshop business at the same time. And, you know, you're talking 15, 16 hours a day trying to run another website. So it was really difficult for that. But yes. And if it's Horia, uh, who I think it is, then um, yes, uh, yes, I do. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next time we get together and have a pint. Fantastic. <laughs> One of these days, one of these days, we'll be able to move again. Alistair, I think that's about all we've got time for. Um, we mentioned obviously social media websites before. Where can people find out more about your work? 
Uh, on Insta, Alistair underscore Ben, A L I S T E R. Um, mm -hmm. So many variations. There are. Um, and uh, Express Photography, which is the YouTube channel, and our website is expressive.photography. It's not a dot com, it's dot photography. They're the main three places. Uh, Facebook, you'll find me on Facebook and stuff as well. But uh, yeah, Insta and the YouTube channel and our website are the main three. I'm not. Oh, your book did you say next spring your book on the gobi is coming out this is your first is your first printed book i heard you say my first photo book yeah it's my first printed photo book and i'm really excited about it i'm talking to the designer this coming week so uh yeah that's the first stage of kicking myself up the backside to try and get it done yeah, put it out there now yeah, so uh Keep, and keep an eye on obviously uh, social media website if you want to find out more about Alistair do that but that is about all we have time for tonight so Alistair a huge thank you uh, for chatting with us for a wee while and it's been really good to meet you in person kind of almost yeah. one of these days uh, we actually will do that uh, this session if you want to catch again if you want to share it with your friends will be available very shortly uh, right here on the Case Fillers UK YouTube channel so do feel free to check that out and share it um, we'll be back on the 14th of February, which we've just twigged is Valentine's Day. So I'll be uh, with Nigel Danson, who many of you will have heard of. He's got a supremely popular uh, YouTube channel, very popular photographer. So very much looking forward to that. If you have got no other plans on Valentine's night, which uh, obviously <laughs> we don't, then do join us same time, 7 p.m. We will be here. Um, you can check out the Case Filters UK website if you want to see who else is coming up over the next few months. Just so let's casefilters.com uh, full listing on there so do have a wee look at that but until next time uh, from myself and from Alistair and from everyone at Case Filters UK have a fantastic rest of the evening and uh, I'll see you in February good night thank you, Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Good night.